This is chapter one, and the, t the heading is The Mercer's Tavern, Farringdon, London, 29th December, 1795, evening. Jack and Billy were in the Mercer's Tavern next to the Farringdon Canal in the city of London. A young aristocrat was sitting with two companions at a card table at the far end of the long bar. Very soon, Jack and Billy were going to rob him. It had been Billy's decision. Had their sister asked Jack this favour, he would have delayed and delayed and Bridget would have had to come up with some other plan. So she had asked Billy. Billy, she said, her voice breaking, I'm in a lot of trouble. Of course, Billy had agreed to help without giving it a second thought. He would get back the amulet the aristocrat had stolen. And when Billy had asked for Jack's assistance, there was never a chance that he would say no. So now the two of them were in the Mercer's Tavern on a desperate enterprise. If it were to go wrong, Billy and he would be swinging from ropes on New Year's Day. Jack found Bridget difficult to deal with at any time, but now she was next to impossible. So what's so important about the amulet, Bridget? He had he'd asked her. That's for me to know. Every conversation turned to the amulet, and as soon as it did, her temper began to fray. Time's running out. Why aren't you doing anything? Jack would stay quiet. Billy would give her a hug and she would burst into tears. Don't you worry, Bridget, he would tell her, rocking her gently. See, me and Jack have a plan. So here was Jack, sitting at a small table near the door with his back to the card players. Every now and then, he peered over the top of his copy of the Fleet Gazette and spied their reflections in a mirror next to the door. The mirror glass had been imperfectly cast and so exaggerated the jerkiness of the men's bodies and contorted their faces into amusing and sometimes alarming expressions. Jack was 18 years of age. His lower lip was split and swollen. From time to time, he passed his tongue over the raw flesh inside his mouth where it had been smashed against his teeth. Occasionally, he dabbed the lower lip with a handkerchief the left side of his cheek and jaw was bruised and swollen. Jack had dressed inconspicuously. He wore a white shirt, fawn-coloured breeches, white hose and brown shoes. Around his neck and hidden from view was a chain from which hung a yellow butterfly. This marked him as a follower of the maiden in her first aspect. It, to wear it was an offence under church ordinance number 14 and punishable by seven years transportation to Terra Australis. Jack looked across at Billy who was leaning against the bar cradling a white clay pipe in his hand. He could see his brother was also keeping half an eye open on the card table. Billy was 20 years of age although he had never celebrated a birthday in his life. His fair hair was cut short and lightly powdered as was the fashion amongst the young. Billy had dressed flamboyantly. His shirt was made from Irish linen Black breeches adorned at the knees with silver buckles and a pair of red pointed shoes tied with black ribbon bows completed the effect. Their quarry, a man in his early twenties, was refilling his glass. His expression seemed cast in a perpetual sneer. He was exquisitely dressed in white and gold. He was flaunting the amber amulet he had stolen from the maiden temple openly over the top of his shirt the young aristocrat's name was Hugo, Viscount Peterfield. He was the son of the Earl of Etchingham and was thus a member of the royal court. He was therefore, to all intents and purposes, above the law. The Viscount sat facing the bar. His companions were stationed on either side of him. The fourth chair was empty. The three men had been drinking for some time and were laughing loudly, shouting lewd comments at the tavern serving girls and issuing jocular challenges to one another. Now they emptied their purses and stacked piles of gold and silver coins in front of them. The man facing the two brothers opened the table drawer and took out a box pack of playing cards. He held it up for the others to see, then cut open the crown revenue seal and dealt each a hand. To their left, Beyond the end of the bar, 
sat the girl Agatha with her friends. Jack saw her reflection the moment before she saw his. He shaded his eyes and began to study the news pamphlet intently. But within moments, Agatha was standing behind the other chair at the small table. Her expression, a mixture of hesitancy and boldness. Then she pulled it back and sat down, a shy smile. Haven't seen you in a while, Jack. He looked up briefly and nodded. Have you missed me? Jack could feel Billy's eyes boring into the side of his head. He nodded, turned the page and said nothing. She looked at him, her excitement turning to an apparent realisation. Oh, are you waiting for someone? He looked up. Yes, kind of. A girl. He hated to do this to her. He liked her a lot. Where else could he say? Yes. She stood up, embarrassed. I'll be seeing you then, Jack. He heard the sadness in her voice. She looked up. He looked up, gave her a quick smile, which almost split open his lip, and then returned his attention to the pamphlet. A minute or so later, he risked looking at the mirror again. He could see Agatha talking to her friends. The card players were intent on the second hands they had been dealt. Jack and Billy had been observing the Viscount for over a week. They were staying at a townhouse in Bloomsbury. The Earl and his son spent freely wherever they went and passed most evenings at the theatre or gambling in taverns and drinking clubs. A street news vendor had overheard a conversation and told Billy and Jack that the Earl would be at the Mercer's Tavern that evening. The plan was simple. He and Billy would wait until the tavern was full and most of its customers were three parts drunk. Then they would relieve the Viscount of both the wallet and the amulet and be gone before anyone realised what had happened. Simple, yes, but as he considered it, Jack felt dread drop heavily onto his shoulders and he took several deep breaths. Calmer now, Jack looked around. He sipped his wine. It was sweet compared with the coppery taste of blood leaking out onto his tongue. Billy was flirting with one of the tavern girls. He was all good looks and easy charm. He was mimicking the expressions and mannerisms of some of the tavern's more eccentric patrons, and the girl was giggling. For a moment, Jack envied his brother's apparent absence of nerves, or as was more probable, his lack of imagination. Jack knew that one day, very likely, the two of them would make that last boat journey to Tower Hill, and the girl would be there in the crowd, and that she would cry for Billy. Groups of men had settled at most of the tables along the length of the three rooms. Scattered amongst them were those who had lost limbs in the continental and colonial wars. Some were talking in whispered tones, some bellowing with laughter, and some wolfing down snacks bought in cook shops. There were more outside, lounging by the slow-moving waters of the Farringdon Canal. But now Jack's attention was drawn back to the card table. A man was joining the group. Jack had never seen him before. He appeared a little older than the other three, in his late twenties. His shirt and hose were white, his breeches a rich cream colour, and he wore a chocolate brown waistcoat. His name, though Jack did not know this yet, was Michael Basilicus. With him was the Earl of Etchingham. Behind them, the door to a private room had been left open. The Earl whispered something in his son's ear, but the young Viscount barely acknowledged him. He said his farewells and strolled between the two brothers into the night. Jack watched the spectacle over the top of his paper. The card players quietened when they noticed the newcomer standing at the table. Michael Basilicus pulled back the fourth chair and sat down. He poured himself a drink. Good evening, gentlemen, he said with a smile and raised his glass. Your very good health. The others hurried to raise theirs to return the compliment. Michael Basilicus put his glass down and peeled off his kid gloves. He took out his purse and poured a stream of gold guineas onto the table. Jack, whose hearing was acute, closed his eyes and concentrated. London was a melting pot of accents and Jack had an ear for them. The man spoke English precisely with an inflection. Basilicus was Greek and therefore possibly a shipping line owner. There were plenty of Greek ships plying their trade between the port of London and the Mediterranean. Jack opened his eyes. 
But Zilliker slowly turned his head and stared at Jack's reflection in the mirror. Jack blinked, then averted his gaze. He caught Billy's eyes and instantly regretted it. He looked back at Basilicus, who now stared at Billy, and then at Jack again. Jack buried his head in the pamphlet. He was appalled. He had given Billy and himself away. Okay, that's it. Thank you.